Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And some of you are directly involved in the resurrection ministry of Jesus Christ. And you didn't know it. And today you'll hear why. And I pray we all will have a better understanding of the healing ministry of Jesus. For in Christ, we are restored to body and soul communion with God. Now, there are many other, many views of the body out there. There is, in our world anyway, the, the common materialist view. That is, you understand our, our bodies and the world, for that matter, simply by what we can observe with our senses. And I think if, if that's the way you look at the body, it, you have an almost logical conclusion that the purpose of the body then, just by observation, the purpose of the body is to die. Because that's what we observe. It lives for a while, and then it dies. But that, friends, doesn't speak to the deeper truth that we know. And in fact, if you're going to be a true scientist, that we observe. The truth to which the scriptures speak. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we have the account of the creation. And where you have a God who is love and a God who is outside of time and a, and a God who speaks the world into existence as, as an expression of his creative love. In the very height of that creation are the man and the woman who are created, the scriptures tell us, in the image of God. By the larger context of the scripture, we know that that means that they're not God, but there are ways in which they are like God, and of course, ways in which they are not like God. Like God in, in having eternal nature now, an eternal soul, right? Created to live for eternity. Like God in creativity. Like God in, in the ability to receive and to give love. Unlike God in that we are not all-powerful, we're not omnipotent. Unlike God in that we're not omniscient, we're not all-knowing. And then, of course, in the next chapter, in Genesis 3, we have the beginning of the description of the world truthfully as we know it. A world that after, after our four parents decided and rebelled against God because they wanted to be gods unto themselves and brought therefore destruction. A great and pernicious cancer on the world that affects everything. The relationship between man and woman who were created to work complementary and harmony and, and have benevolent dominion over the world now are, are, is a relationship sometimes of power dynamics and difficulty and challenge. The creation itself is a, a struggle to bear fruit and the childbearing pains and all those things that Genesis 3 describes. And, and yet, even after the fall into sin, there is still something of the image that the, speaker, that the speakers of the Scriptures bear witness to. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 1, when Jeremiah the prophet is called into the ministry by the Lord, he says, Before I formed you in the womb. The Lord says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb. And that bears witness to there's something that God is still at work, even though the image of God is so deeply marred after the fall into sin. Now, a week and a half back or so, Pastor Shockman and I were at a conference on what is called the theology of the body. And on one of these mornings, there were sectional papers delivered. And so, being the morning person that I am, I got up early, uh, like 7 o'clock, uh, to hear this presentation by a young theologian from our St. Louis seminary named Kendall Davis. And seminarian Davis asked a question related to the body that I hadn't thought of before. And he said, we, when we think about the healing ministry of Jesus, we usually think of the, the healing ministry of Jesus as, as really only about Jesus showing his divine authority. That, that authority that shows that he is God 
and that he has authority then to, to lay down his life for us and to take it up again. And that's typically how we speak of the healing ministry of Jesus. And that is, of course, it is the central thing. Right? The miracles of Jesus, the healing ministry of Jesus, do show above all his, his authority, that he is God. And so that when we speak about the purpose of, of Christian preaching and worship, for example, in 1 Corinthians 1, we preach Christ crucified. Or Jesus himself, before he ascends into heaven, in Luke chapter 24, summarizes all of the scriptures in this way. He says, thus it is written, that the Son of Man should die and on the third day rise from the dead, and, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Because God is love, and love never ends. Love does what is necessary for the beloved, and this is why Jesus came, to express his love for us by redeeming us, by buying us back by his death and resurrection. And to be sure, the healing ministry of Jesus, whether it's the casting out of demons, which we heard about today, or the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, as we heard about today, the healing ministry of Jesus most definitely points to the authority of Jesus to be our Savior, to lay down his life and take it up again. But as the seminarian reminded us in this paper, I was struck by this also. There's more to that. There's more to the healing ministry of Jesus than, than simply showing us that he has a divine authority. The healing ministry of Jesus actually shows us the purpose of the body. The healing ministry of Jesus shows us, reminds us, that what we observe in the world is not actually true. The purpose of the body is not simply to live and then to die. We are meant to live. And every time Jesus heals, it shows that truth. We are meant to live, not die, because our bodies are not shells for a soul. We are created, body and soul. We are embodied souls. Meant for eternally, eternity bodily with God. And everywhere that Jesus goes and heals, he shows this truth. That contrary to the world, the purpose of the body is to live eternally in communion with God. And that's wonderful, isn't it? And I think it transforms the way that some of us should look at our work. For example, right, if, if the healings that take place in the world, as the healings that take place where bodies are, are made whole or improve, improved as it were, health is improved, we tend to view this simply in materialist terms. But if we will put on the eyes of faith, we can see that whenever a healing occurs, that it's actually God at work. And in, in each of these instances, we, we see a, a glimpse of the true purpose of the body. And so, you know, if you're in health care as a Christian, you may not have thought of it this way, but you are, in a very real sense, participating in the resurrection ministry of Jesus Christ. Whether that's, quite frankly, bandaging the womb or the, the, the wound of a child, or the most advanced neurosurgery. God is at work, and when we observe these healings, then it's an opportunity for us to give thanks to God for the way he works. And these things, even though, right, our world is broken, when healing takes place, it is a witness for us of the true and eternal purpose of the body, that we were meant not to die, but in fact, to live. There are then also some important conclusions for all of us this morning and a cause for repentance, quite frankly, for all of us, from the youngest to the oldest. If our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and they are, if the healing ministry of Jesus is an enactment of the kingdom of God by which we understand the true purpose of the body, that we are not meant to die but to live, then when we abuse our bodies, we are not simply damaging the shell, but we are, in fact, involved in destruction of a temple. And that's a cause of repentance 
for all of us. The overeating, the overdrinking, the sexually rebellious activity that, that brings destruction, the whole gamut of things. It's a cause for all of us, and I mean that, for all of us, to repent. It's also a cause for us, friends, to repent of our belittling of the body. Right? If indeed our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, meant for eternal body and soul communion with God, then when we belittle the body, when we treat it like it's nothing or relatively unimportant, we are, we are actually in rebellion against God. I was thinking about this, and this, is, this will be hard for some of us to hear because it's such common language, but it's been a cause of repentance for me to think about. Think about funerals. A funeral occurs and there's a casket here. And so often people say, well, that's not Uncle Fred, or that's not Bonnie, or that's not Tom. We understand the Scripture. That's not actually true, is it? See, when, when we speak in that way, doesn't that say that the body is really unimportant? And is that something as a Christian that we want to say or that we should say? Should we say, should we intone, should we bear witness in any way that the body is unimportant? I would contend, right, based on the scriptures, that we most certainly should not. Because, right, this, when, a, when someone dies and there's a casket here, it's not entirely true that Bonnie or Sue or Fred is not there. It is their body. What happens at death is that this, our body and soul union is a rent asunder. And that is, obvi- that is not God's will for us, is it? This is why, historically, Jews and Christians have cared for the body at death. Because the body is meant not for death, but for eternal life with Christ our Lord. Friends, friends, this very morning, the Lord has gathered us here to hear this word, to repent of our sins, and, and grace upon grace, this marvelous gift Because the God who spoke all things into existence, the God who redeemed all of creation in Christ, the God God who showed his will for the body by taking on and and embodying God himself, right? Because that's what the incarnation of Jesus Christ is. Right here this morning, the Lord comes to us, body and soul. Jesus, who redeemed you, comes. And he offers you not just a symbol and not just a remembrance, but according to his word, his body and his eternal blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. That Jesus would do this for us is then a reminder for us. Every time we gather, as we kneel or stand at the rail and receive the supper, that you are, our bodies are sacred and holy temples of the Lord. So regardless of how frail you may be, or however you may feel, this morning, God of the universe comes to you comes to us in his resurrection body and declares you his own and forgives you. Friends, this supper that we have is indeed a foretaste of our body and soul reunion with God and all his saints through time. In Christ, we are restored to body and soul communion with God. 
And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.